Welcome to chapter eight. In this chapter, we're going to look at the building blocks of an organization, which is culture, structure, and design. By the time you're done reading this chapter, you should be able to explain the importance um, and why it's important for managers to align a company's vision and strategies with their culture and structure, and how you can go about finding out your organization's social glue in its normal way of doing business and what can be done to an organization's culture to increase its economic performance. You should also be able to answer um, how for-profit, non-profit, and mutual benefit organizations are structured and when you join an organization of the seven elements that you should look for and um, how would you describe those seven organizational structures. And then of course the factors that affect the design of an organization's structures. So, how you can stand out in a new job. Fitting into the culture of an organization within the first 60 days. First things first are our first impressions and being aware of the power of first impressions. The power of how you first engage with each and every person that you come in contact with. It's in, so important. It's so powerful because you can make or break yourself within those first few moments because when we meet people, we immediately place an imprint on them and we have a judgment and a stereotype and a bias and we immediately confirm who we think they are based on their engagement and interaction with us. So being mindful of that. Making sure that you come in 30 minutes early and you stay a little late to see how people behave is important to see. You get to see a lot when you come in early and you stay a little late. They and But also people get to see that in you. Getting to know some people and listen to what they have to say about the company, about the, organ, about the um, organization's leaders, about the culture, um, about the ebb and flow, about you know, the quote unquote, this is the way we do things. And it's important that you make it easy for other people to give you feedback. Don't be closed off. Don't think you're Miss or Mr. Know-it-all. Be open and receptive to that feedback because it makes you um, more embedded into the culture where you are more of the, of the team and less of an outsider. And of course, over deliver. You say you're going to do something, do it, and then throw the cherry on top of the sundae. Just sweeten the deal even more. So that's how you can stand out and be a star. <clears throat> so what does it mean to fit in? Um, you have a job interview. What is the fit? What is it that's that, that point where they know that you will make it work and you will be a good fit? A person who is conducting the interview looks to see to the extent that your personality and values match the climate, the environment, and the culture of that organization. If you are very rigid and highly structured and the organization is very flexible and just lackadaisical or carefree or just hang loose, that's not a good fit. If you need to do the same mundane task repeatedly, but yet this organization is all about throwing stuff and making it work and we're just going to go, we may change all over the place and it's a consistent change environment, um, disruptive forces that come in and out um, and very innovative and just alive, and that's not a good thing. Um, if your religious views somehow pour through in your conversation and you are high and mighty in your viewpoint, then you may not need to work in an organization that is more casual in their approach to um, social interactions and things of that nature. Um, they don't have time for the high and mighty, right? <laughs> so that is how you can determine fit. It's looking at the environment, the culture, the, the, the um, rhythm of an organization. Um, and you don't want to stand out like a sore thumb. 
and a good fit is like a puzzle piece. A puzzle piece just slides right into the slot, right? It's not going to be, to it's not going to, you're not going to keep having it twisted and like, gosh, it just, it's not fitting. You're right. It's not fitting because that's not the piece to that puzzle. That puzzle piece needs to go elsewhere. And that's how you can see um, whether or not you're a good fit. And we look at some of the various assumptions that we make and how it affects how work gets done. And when we look at culture, it's we've got our shared, um, taken for granted, implicit assumptions, right? We just it, there's certain things we just take for granted. And this is something that the group holds near and dear in how we determine what we perceive, think about, and how we react to various environments. This is what we also call our corporate culture. And it always starts at the top, right? I, I, I say I will say this uh, through every chapter. Anytime I can mention culture, culture always stop, starts at the top. We have our founders' values, right? We have, um, and so the founder, the chairman, the CEO, the president um, will always form and shape the culture of the organization. Then, um, what blends in are our environments from industry and business. The national culture, you know, you have what your your the country that you that your company is headquartered is located in. You have that national culture that bleeds through. You'll have the vision and strategies of the organization, and then of course you have your other leaders and the behaviors that they possess and express. And so all of those are interwoven into the culture. And so we look at who reports to whom and who does what. And that is your organizational structure, and it's a formal system. And you know, and when, and I, what really is a pet peeve of mine is when you have new hires in an organization and they don't know the formal structure. They don't know who reports to whom. They don't know who does what. Who coordinates and motivates the members of the organization so that things can actually be accomplished. And when you only know who you report directly to, but you don't even know what they do and who they report to, there's a problem. Houston, we have a problem. And every, um, I would say twice a year, an organization should review their org chart, see if there's any changes to it, adjust as needed, put that out there, and be very clear about who reports to whom and who does what. It's like you need to do a field trip through your organization. And the larger the organization, the more field trips you should have because everyone needs to know how each person um, plays a role in that organization, why they're there, what they're doing, and how their role impacts your individual role and vice versa. So we look at our culture plus structure and we look at the drivers of culture and then we have our organizational culture and then the, how that structure and internal processes come into play. Then we have our group and social processes, and then we blend in our work attitudes and behaviors, and all of that rolls into our overall performance. It all rolls into performance. And, um, hold on a second, the slide, there we go. And so we have various competing values that we look at. We have our flexibility and discretion, and we have our internal focus and integration, stability and control, and our external focus and differentiation. And we have the four core um, pillars. We have clan, um, ad hocacy, hierarchy, and market. And ad hocacy is usually shortened to just being ad hoc. Um, so under clan, the, the thrust of clan is a collaborative effort. There's cohesion, empowerment, we're communicating, um, we're focusing on morale and developing our people and a commitment, right? Um, this is more of a, a focus on our in, uh, internal and integration. Um, with ad hoc, it's all about creating and being creative and we're um, adapting and we're agile and there's innovation and growth and cutting edge technology that comes out of it. And under market, we're competitive, right? We are focused on our customer productivity. How can we be more competitive? How can we get a greater market share, um, higher profitability, um, achieve our goals faster and um, 
it's really about just, ah, right? It's going for the gusto. With hierarchy, it's all about control, process control, consistency, what we can be able to measure, capable processes. It's about efficiency and being on time and smooth and functioning. And so it's all about that stability. And so you see how all four of these compete with each other. But they, um, you also can sometimes have a blend of the four in order to make a great circular um, uh, flow within your organization. And um, I've already covered these, but you can see it in, in bold. Um, where with the clan culture, you're, you're more, you, you want more flexibility than you do stability. With ad hoc, um, it's about creativity, being quick to respond to changes in the marketplace. With market culture, you're really focused on that external environment. Um, what happens outside of the organization is what's going to impact your ability to deliver results. With hierarchy, it's very formalized, very structured, with a lot of control mechanisms. And so we look at our three levels of um, culture. We have our observable um, artifacts, and those are how we dress, the awards we receive, various myths and stories that have been shared about the company. Um, of course, the visible behavior that our managers and employees exhibit. Um, level two is our spouse values, right? What we explicitly state as our values and norms and, the, and that which is preferred by the organization. And then our enacted values are represented through the values and norms that are exhibited in the organization. And our basic assumptions represent the core values of our culture. And um, those are usually taken for granted and highly resistant to change, right? Those core values usually are going to kick and fight um, to resist change because it's what makes um, the culture what it is. And so how we go about learning culture symbolically through objects, quality acts, various events that convey a meaning to others through stories, narratives of true events, hopefully, right? Um, <laughs> which are repeated. And sometimes we, they're embellished upon, right? They, at first it was um, $1 million and, and in 10 years, the story's embellished to say it's, it was $20 million, right? And, but there's an uh, emphasis on a particular value. And then of course, there's always a hero. There's some accomplishments that this person has um, reached and it really embodies the values of the organization. And usually that hero is tied to the CEO or chairman or the founder. And then we have our rites and rituals. We have various ceremonies and activities that are both planned and unplanned that we are going to celebrate important occasions and accomplishments in the organization's life. So it could be the um, annual celebration of the anniversary of the founding. It could be where these various benchmarks um, that have taken place in uh, milestones, things of that nature. It could also be when we celebrate um, the employee anniversaries of when you know every year when they've um, the, you know someone's been there five years, twenty years, fifty years. So in Mary Kay Cosmetics, which I was a proud sales consultant with Mary Kay Cosmetics, um, the best salespeople receive pink Cadillacs and special award ceremonies. And oh, I could not wait to be a pink Cadillac producing director. Um, is this an example of symbol, value, writer, ritual, or both symbol, writer, ritual, both A and C? Which one? If you said D, you are correct. It is both, um, it's writer, ritual, and it's symbol, right? Because we have our word ceremonies and we have the pink Cadillac. That's that symbol. Symbol of success. You know you made it when you drive that pink. So what organizational benefits are associated with um, what organizational culture? So when we look at the various variables and then the strength of relationship of not significant through strong, um, under job satisfaction, you see um, clan um, is very strong um, and with the relationship, um, it is also very strong under organizational. 
you see that under objective growth, clan is not significant, right? It's really not significant, as well as under objective profit. When you look at um, market, market is very strong in their subjective innovation and subjective growth is moderate as well as quality of products and services also moderate. With ad hoc, um, it stays moderate for um, job satisfaction, organizational um, commitment, as well as quality of products and services. And then, of course, you see it weakens um, with the last four categories. So you can see that visually. Now, the culture of an organization matters. It's very um, important because employees are happier with clan cultures, right? You, it seems like a family, a unit, a team, it's cohesiveness. And so there's various elements of these cultures that can be used to boost both innovation and quality within an organization. And when you change the culture, it won't necessarily boost performance financially, but it just might. Um, and so if you have a very toxic culture, you imagine if you then adjust that culture into a fruitful and healthy and well-being focused culture and amazingly you could see um, perform productivity go up and usually when productivity goes up you can possibly also track a higher financial performance rate and then of course market cultures tend to produce better results so there's various ways that we can change through formal statements, um, slogans and sayings, rites and rituals, stories, legends and myths, leaders' reaction to crises, and of course, through role modeling, training, and coaching. I truly think that one of the most effective ways to change culture is through um, role modeling, training, and coaching. Um, I believe that if the top does it, if the top trains it, if the top reinforces it through coaching, and then it is reinforced and it is modeled and is trained all the way through the organization, then all the other things are just the extra layers of the Sunday, right? Um, but number six is the ice cream. Six is the ice cream and one to five are all the extra toppings. But literally, it's not a Sunday without ice cream. And that's what, to me, number six represents. Because you can make all the formal statements you want. It doesn't matter what you say. It's what you do. It's how you make people feel. And walking the walk is way more of it, has a greater impact, considerably more than talking. We don't want to hear, we, we can care less about what you say. What are you doing? How are you making us feel? Because you can say whatever you want. You can talk till you turn blue in the face. But if you're mistreating us, if, if this is a toxic environment, if it is fear-based, if we are always terrified of losing our job or if there's harassment or bullying or whatever, it doesn't matter what your slogans are. It doesn't matter the rites and rituals. You can have all the celebrations of anniversaries if you want. It doesn't matter the stories of the past and the legends and the myths. Who cares? Who cares how the CEO deals with crisis? And let's look. Role models. We have positive role models and negative role models. So if you have positive role modeling reinforced with training and coaching, that's the ice cream. The rest are just the toppings. So we can also look at um, physical design. Rewards, titles, promotions, and bonuses. That's always a great way to change culture, right? Um, organizational goals and performance criteria. Measurable and controllable activities, right? So we can measure and we can control. We can sit back and see um, how far we've progressed or deviated from what our target is. Um, organizational structure and, of course, our systems and procedures. So when we look at the structure, the organization is um, all of our coordinated activities or forces of two or more people, right? 
and we have our for-profits, our non-profits, and our mutual benefit organizations. For-profits are formed literally to make money or profits by either selling a product or a service. A non-profit is formed to offer services to certain clients. It is not focused on making a profit. It needs to make a profit in order to stay in business. What I mean by that is this, it, a broke company, right? A company that has no profit cannot stay in business. The difference is, is how you use the profit. In a for-profit organization, you can use the money any way you want. You can just sit it in the bank. You don't have to touch it. You can just sit back and say, we have cash on hand. In a, for, in a non-profit, excuse me, that money has to be accounted for. So if you had expected to get $500 million in and somehow you ended up with $700 million that comes in, you have to account for that $200 million. What services is or programs or projects will that $200 million go towards? Because it can't just sit there. At that point, you're turning a profit on the books. And so it can't. So it has to be accounted for. And so that's where um, that is um, comes into play. Now, when we have mutual benefit organizations, that's where you have a voluntary collective. And their purpose is to advance the interest of their members. And the focus is on that. And so we have United Way, a charitable organization. I happen to know the president of United Way of Atlanta. And um, is it a for-profit, a non-profit, a mutual benefit, or can it be any of the above? If you said B, non-profit, you're correct. So we come up with org charts, and these are boxes and lines that illustrate the formal uh, chain of authority and command within your organization. So you can see all the official positions or different specializations. And so it gives you a visual of who everyone is, their title, and basically from there, you can build off of what they do for the organization. So here's an example of an org chart, and this is one that was designed for a hospital. So you can see the different areas and who reports to whom. We have various elements of an organization. Here's three right here with the common purpose is what unifies us. Um, it gives everyone an understanding of why the organization is in existence, why it was founded and started, why everyone comes in every day. We have a coordinated effort where we can look at our individual efforts into the group. Um, and then division of labor is how we arrange the parts of a task that's done by different people. Hierarchy of authority is that control mechanism that makes sure the right people are doing the right thing at the right time. And that's also called unity of command. Then span of control can be narrow or wide, and it refers to the number of people that report directly to a given manager. So you can have one person that reports up to a manager. You can have four or five or 10 or 20 people that report directly to a specific manager. So it can be very narrow or wide. Then we have um, authority, responsibility, and delegation. Under authority, it gives you the right um, to, um, in a managerial position, to make decisions and to utilize resources. But you can also be given authority even if you're not a manager. And a manager can give you the authority to do certain things. Accountability is who's holding you responsible for the work that's supposed to be done for what you said you were going to do. So managers need to be able to report and justify the results to managers above them. And with responsibility, it's your obligation to perform the task assigned to you. And delegation is where you're going to assign authority and responsibility um, to employees that are below you on, on the, the totem pole or the, the ladder or uh, the pyramid or any other kind of little figure or symbol you want to use. And so line managers, which are your frontline managers, have the authority to make decisions and usually have people reporting to them. Our staff personnel have authority functions and they can provide advice, recommendations, and research to um, frontline managers. So that's how those um, play into um, our delegation. And see, here's a figure right here. So you have your board of directors with your CEO and then the president. Sometimes the CEO and president are one and the same. Um, and then, of course, you have your strategic planning advisor and your legal counsel who 
um, support the CEO, and then um, the president has a cost containment staff, and then um, who reports directly up to the president happens to be the executive administrative director and the executive medical director. Once again, this is an example based off of a hospital. So there's some um, centralized and decentralized authority. And let's look at the two. So centralized is important when decisions are made by higher level managers. So it's usually your senior management or your senior management team, which would be your C-suite, which is the CEO, CFO, CIO, CMO, usually anyone has one of those three letter um, titles. And then decentralized goes further, it goes down the, the portal. And so where um, some important decisions can be made by mid-level or supervisory level or front level, frontline managers. And so um, it's now going down the tunnel versus it only being um, left to the most senior managers in the organization. So under traditional designs, we have a simple structure. You have the owner administrative assistant, right? It's just a single person that has a few rules and some low work specialization. And that's the traditional, and this is usually how our micro enterprises begin. Then under a fun functional structure, you have people with similar occupational specialties that are put together in formal groups. So you see the president and the chief administrator have their groups. And there's a structure for a business, and then you'll see the structure for a hospital. So you can see the two different structures. So under a business, you have the president. And under that president, you have a VP of marketing, one of um, finance, a VP of production, and then a, the VP of human resources. Under the hospital, you'll have a chief of medical services, director of administrative services, director of outpatient services, and a director of nutrition and food services. And you see that they report up to the chief administrator. So you see these two different structures but they're both in the traditional design. So XYZ Hospital has a Chief of Medical Services, a Director of Administrative Services, and a Director of Outpatient Services. Which structure is it, folks? Is it functional, simple, divisional, or matrix? You said functional, you're correct. So under a divisional structure, um, it's, you'll see the three different. We have a product division, a customer division, a geographic division. Um, and so you'll have diverse occupational specialties that are put together in formal groups by similar products or customer types or geographic regions. And so when we look under the different product types, we have a president who is over, and then um, the, those are the divisions that that president is responsible for is you see motion pictures and television, um, music, magazine and book, and internet products divisions. So those are the four divisions of that pot that that president um, is responsible for. Then under customer division, you see that there's consumer loans, mortgage loans, business loans, agricultural loans. Clearly, this is um, a financial services uh, uh, entity. And then the third, geographic. So you have western, northern, southern, eastern regions that this president has been over. So you can see how you can um, break up divisions and design divisions based on different kind of categories. Under the matrix system, this is usually found um, in um, universities, but also um, corporations, large corporations uh, dealing with technology and different kinds of complexities, um, like IBM is under a matrix organization, and so they have um, they combine both the functional and divisional chains of command in a grid, so there are two command structures, both vertical and horizontal. And so I'm going to expand this so that you can see um, that you have the president, and then the president has um, the functional structures, the VP of engineering, finance, production, and marketing. And then the project structure is the Project Manager Taurus, Project Manager Mustang, Project Manager Explorer, Project Manager Expedition. So you can see that this is for Ford, right? This is for the Ford Motor Company. And the subordinate, or the team member, because I don't like the word subordinate, but it's a, tech, a technical term throughout all business. Subordinate reports to both the VP of Marketing and to the Project Manager for Mustang. 
Um, so you see that they're having to report to two. You may have to report to more than two. And so it can be, there are some pluses and minuses to this matrix structure. Um, Um, and um, some of the pluses and minuses is that with the matrix, um, if one or more of the VPs um, are having it out, right, they're not getting along for whatever reason, and um, you have the marketing VP and the production VP are mad, and you have to report to them about a decision that, that you need, and one VP says, yes, it's a green light, and the other VP says, no, it's not, you can have some problems. Um, and so there's, <laughs> there could be some issues with ego and, and uh, control and all kinds of things that can come into play. And so this is something that has to really be massaged through um, an organization to make sure that the culture is um, is one that um, supports team decision making and getting I and me and ego out of the way. Um, but it can be very efficient um, in the fact that it's combining these two different chains. And um, here you'll see the horizontal team where you have these your teams or work groups and sometimes they can be temporary or permanent and it's helping to improve collaboration and work on various tasks by breaking them down in um, internal boundaries. And I'm going to zoom in so that you can see um, how that works. So you have your functional structure, right, that's normally set up with all your VPs with the president above. You have your project team, so it could be product team manager over manufacturing like trucks. The other um, team manager is over sedans, and then the third team manager is over sports cars. And then you see that they each have their five um, project team members that report to them. But you see the zigzagging of um, whom they report to. So the team members report up to their product team managers. And then if you notice that all of the product team managers <laughs> zigzag in who they report to. So when we look at the team manager for manufacturing light trucks, he or she is reporting to the VP of research and development, design, engineering, and marketing. Right? And the same is true for the other product managers. So it can just kind of all zigzag. And then those VPs are making decisions um, so that those project teams can actually um, be able to get the job done. And so this may be a temporary um, setup, but this can also be permanent. But it really were, it's, it's making sure that everyone is collaborating and sharing various tasks. And so it breaks everything down so that you now have those team members below the team manager um, then taking the larger piece of slice or the larger pizza and then breaking it down into, into slices so that it, um, the, it can be consumed much faster. I love using food analogies if you can't tell. <laughs> So, we have um, different designs um, that open boundaries within and between organizations. And a hollow structure has a central core of key functions, right? Um, and if you see that in this one, the core of personal computer company that's in the U.S. With that, um, you have these functions and you then outsource other functions to vendors who can do them cheaper or faster. So you have your core and then you are going to outsource your engineering company to Japan, your accounting and finance to um, the, a, a company in, in the US, 
um, a distribution company in Canada, your components assembly um, to Mexico and Asia, and design studio um, will handle everything in Sweden. And so you then are only focusing on the core. Everything else you've outsourced. Right? And this happens more times than you know. That's what makes our the global economy so strong um, and has made our world smaller, meaning that it has allowed us to um, um, build greater relationships with other company, uh, excuse me, other countries um, because of that. And so we also have a modular structure that um, where an organization can assemble product chunks or modules provided by outside contractors. With a virtual organization, the members are geographically apart and usually interacting and working with email, collaborative computing, and other computer connections. With a virtual structure, the company outside of a company that is created specifically to respond to um, what is considered exceptional market opportunity, but also understanding that it's often temporary. So it has to be, um, you have to have some, a laser focused in, in um, a, high, a fast reaction time. So mechanistic versus organic organizations. A mechanistic organization is centralized um, hierarchy of authority, right? Um, so everything's up towards the top. There's a lot of rules and procedures, a lot of red tape. There's specialized tasks, formalized communication, meaning there's memos, structured emails, letters. Um, there are a few teams or task forces because they're very traditional. Um, and there's a narrow span of control, taller structures. And so that means that um, you'll usually have um, one person that is over a few people kind of thing. Under an organic organization, it's decentralized hierarchy, fewer rules and procedures, less red tape, their shared task is more of a team um, concept, informal communication, it could be email, IM, um, chat, text, um, many teams or task forces. There's a wider span of control and the structure is flatter. And the difference between a flat structure and a taller structure is taller structures, there's usually, you know, six layers between the front line and the senior level team members. Um, and a flatter structure is probably three levels, right? Um, and so usually the flatter the structure and oftentimes, the quicker decisions can be made because there's less chains and channels and ladders and rungs you have to go up to in order to get a decision made. So we have differentiation versus integration. Differentiation is the tendency of the parts within an organization to disperse and fragment. So I look at that as you have puzzle pieces that um, are all part of the puzzle but they're all spread out. Integration is in when you bring those pieces together to achieve a common purpose. Those pieces come together and bam, you see the, the beautiful um, painting that um, had been fragmented and now it's together. Um, so those are the two. So with that, that is the end of um, chapter eight. If you have any questions, you know how to reach me. Thank you guys for everything. Appreciate it.